morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And we are back in 1 John chapter 5 this morning, and we are very close to the end of the book of 1 John. So I hope you've enjoyed this study. We just have a couple of more uh, lessons that are in 1 John, and then we'll pick up a different book when we come back. But let's go ahead and read 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, when we come to this passage, there's a statement that's made that really, I think a lot of Christians, when they read it, become... Uh, quite concerned, honestly. And that is this phrase that there is a sin unto death. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about this topic, and we're going to look at it in two parts. We're going to look at some introductory matters dealing with this, and I think that one of the questions that we need to answer is, how does God deal with a Christian who is sinning? And how does he deal with them in the sense of punishment and discipline or chastening? I think it's a really important thing for us to understand. Not every sin is going to lead to terrible consequences of God's direct judgment. Sometimes what God will do is simply allow us to experience the natural consequences of our sin. And so when we're doing that, those natural consequences are not necessarily God's judgment. It's simply him allowing sin to take its ultimate end. There are times, however, that God does chasten us. And when he chastens us, we need to understand the way he goes about doing that. And the purpose of chastening really is so that God can see us restored to himself and restored to others. So this is an important discussion for us to have. Let me give you a simple summary statement of this passage, and then we'll dig into a couple of important facts that are introductory to this discussion. The purpose of the section in front of us is to teach that Christians should live the Christian life prudently. Because a presumptuous attitude towards God can lead to irre, irre, irreversible discipline. And when we talk about irreversible discipline, what we're saying is there can be a point where the Christian crosses a line, and when they cross the line, God doesn't give them the opportunity to come back. Now, when I make a statement like that, please don't think that this is something that God does immediately or that God does irrationally or simply out of a fit of anger. That's not the point. In fact, as we get into this passage, we're going to see that God's very patient with people. He's very measured in how he deals with people. When God gets to the point where he takes someone early out of this world, it's because it's very severe and the consequences of what they're doing and how it's affecting other people and how it's affecting the church is so serious that God decides enough is enough. So let's look at a couple of details in this passage to kind of help us understand the topic. The first detail is this. There is something called a sin unto death. Obviously, the passage mentions it. It doesn't just mention it one. In fact, it mentions it multiple times. There is such a thing as a sin unto death. On the other side, it also mentions that there is such a thing as a sin that's not unto death. In fact, he tells people that if a person has sinned a sin that's not unto death, then you need to pray for them. And you say, well, why is he ask, Why is he telling them to pray for them? Well, the indication is that these people are probably in a position where they've been disciplined by God. They're going through perhaps some kind of sickness or something like that. And it's directly related to their rebellion, though they are a Christian. And so he's saying, pray for that person. If that person is repentant, then God is going to heal them. And there's actually, uh, in, when we talk about the book of James, it talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availing much. He's actually talking about the context of someone who is in sin, and it's gotten to a point where this person's been so stubborn and so rebellious that God brings something very specific, some kind of a, a punishment, a discipline, something to humble them, get their attention. And when God does that, the person becomes repentant. They actually respond well to that. It didn't need to get to that point, but it did. And when it did, thankfully, the person responded in humility. And he says, pray for that person. God will restore them, heal them, strengthen them. That's the point that he's talking about. In other words, that particular sickness that that person received 
was directly connected to a series of rebellious, uh, ignoring of God's ways. But we need to understand that not all sickness is a direct result of a specific sin. Sometimes God uses sickness in totally other, other ways. Sometimes God uses it not to humble us because we're in rebellion, but simply to teach us things about his ways. And we don't understand how all that works, but we need to understand this passage does establish there are some sinful patterns that lead to ultimately God taking a person early, or there are some sins that they don't, but they are severe and there have been some kind of consequence associated with it. Fact number three, there's no point in praying for healing for a person that has sinned to sin and a death. <laughs> in other words, he's saying there are times where a person has crossed the line and they have been so stubborn and so rebellious that really there's no point in saying, God, restore this person. They are completely rebellious in that matter. And you say, well, at what point do you come to the conclusion that that's how you're supposed to respond? Well, the passage doesn't tell us. We have no idea. And so the truth is that we should always be praying that a person comes to repentance when they are a professing Christian in rebellion against God. And we should pray that God will restore a person's health when they're in that situation. But we need to recognize that there are limits to what God will do with that person in that situation. And then fact number four, a person who's sick but has not committed a sin unto death can be healed if it's God's will. And we ask him to heal. And so that's really the, the four facts that we find associated with the passage in front of us. So in order for us to really understand this in its context, I think it's important for us to deal with a couple of details that are part of this. When we read this passage, I want you to realize this is not someone who is just doing something in ignorance or somebody who is doing something where they are in a constant battle and they're struggling with sin and they fall to sin and then they repent and they're restored. In fact, when we talk about many, many Christians go through repetitive cycles of struggle, that's really not the sense of what he's talking about here. We're not, a, we're not talking about a person that has this besetting sin that's constantly plaguing them. They fall prey to it, they repent, they're restored, they have a season of victory, and then they fall again, and they go through this process over and over and over again. That's not what we're talking about. He's talking specifically in the context about false teachers. And these false teachers are people who are claiming to be preaching the doctrines of Christ. They are claiming to be preaching and teaching the truth. And not only are these teachers claiming to be teaching and preaching the truth, but they're causing untold damage to the church. In fact, we see that the tone of this letter is that he's constantly confronting specific kinds of false teaching that these folks are bringing into the church. They're being very disruptive. They're attacking God's work in the church. Now, some people don't realize that that's what they're doing, but their, their teachings are so dam damaging and they're undermining the doctrine that is in the church so much that God is going to deal with these folks. These false teachers were not just causing damage to the church in general, but to the specific individuals of the church. When John looks at certain Christians, people have professed faith in Christ, they've walked in the church, and all of a sudden they're beginning to embrace these false teachings, it grieved him. And let's remember that John was a pastor. That was his heartbeat. That was his passion. He's writing to people that he has shepherd, shepherded and he loves. But John's love for them is really just a reflection of Christ's love for them. And so as he's writing to these people, He's writing to people that are being disrupted personally and corporately by false teachers. False teachers who are actually undermining the work of God. There's a fourth aspect. Some of these people in the church had become sick. In other words, there were some kinds of physical ailments that they had, that they had received. And what's interesting is when we talk about sickness in the Bible, there's a lot that we can't fully wrap around. We know that God is providentially working in people's lives, helping them to stay strong and allowing them to become sick. We know that not all sickness leads to death. We not, know that not all sickness is a direct result of some physical con or some spiritual consequence. I mean, think of the example of, of the blind man who Jesus said, who sinned? this man or his father? And Jesus says, neither. 
excuse me, the disciples asked, who sinned, this man or his, or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. But his blindness is ultimately going to redound to God's glory. We have examples of people who God allowed to become sick. We even have Lazarus, the man who God allowed to die so that Christ could raise him from the dead and demonstrate his power over the resurrection or over the, over death and the resurrection and really to prepare the people for the fact that he would go to the cross, he would die and he would rise from the dead. In other words, when we talk about this issue of sickness, we need to understand that it is a very complex discussion. It is very nuanced. But there were people in the church who became physically weak and sick. Very similar to like the same thing that happened in Corinth. We had people who were coming to the Lord's table. And there were folks who were causing tremendous divisions in the church during the Lord's table. Some people were becoming intoxicated, they're becoming drunk. They weren't allowing the poor to come at the same time that they were coming. There was this terrible division, this terrible separation. It was something that undermined the beauty of the picture of communion, the body coming together and worshiping and remembering the death of Christ, his body broken, his blood shed. And so what did God do? God was trying to get the attention of those who were most at fault in the church. Some people, they're, they're were, they were so rebellious on this issue and causing such a disruption that God actually took them home early. They died prematurely. It's as if God gave them a period of time, and he said, because of your rebellion, I'm shortening that time. There were others who were weak and sickly. They did not die, but it was God getting their attention, and those people would have later been restored. James talks about the same thing. This is the sense of what we're talking about here. People who are physically weak and sick. Some of these people are going to recover. Some of them will not. And so John is basically saying, some of these people have sinned and God is dealing with them on this issue, but it's not going to lead to death. They're going to be humbled by what's going on. They're going to listen to the instructions that God's given. There's going to be repentance. There's going to be humility. There's going to be restoration. And these people will recover fully. Others will continue in their rebellion. They will ignore what's being said. And their sickness will lead to death. In other words, this is the sense of what he's talking about. And so my assumption is that he is primarily talking about false teachers, the disruptors, the hardened ones, who are sinning a sin leading unto death. And those who are sick are those who are embracing their teaching, but will ultimately repent and be restored. And that is why God will extend their days and preserve their lives. We understand that Christians who are dealing with serious physical ailments were either false teachers or those that were embracing the things that they were teaching. And really, that's the sense of what we're talking about here. I'm going to go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, just so that you can get a sense of how that really is the context. He says, little children, this is the last time. And you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. I want to add something here that's very important. In the early days when God was giving us his word, when the apostles were living, when they're writing the scriptures, one of the things that we see about the apostles is not only were they eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ, not only were they speaking and writing with the authority of Christ, but God gave them miraculous gifts, signs and wonders that they performed at their hands, that were meant to demonstrate the authenticity of the message that they were proclaiming. One of the reasons that God dealt so severely with false teachers, particularly in this time, is because through dealing with false teachers severely, he was drawing a line of distinction between those who were true prophets of God, true apostles of Christ, and those who were false teachers 
false prophets, false apostles. And so when we read a passage like this, we need to understand that in the background, in the context, is really this division between those who are teaching the truth and those who are claiming an authority that they did not possess. One of the reasons we see such a strong division and why God would deal so harshly with these individuals who are false teachers is that that is part of the authentication process. God putting his stamp of approval on those who are speaking the truth and God saying these are not. When we come to this passage, we need to understand that is a major point that is behind the scenes when we talk about this sin unto death. Next time we come together, I'd like us to talk a little bit about how God deals with people when they sin. And I think it's really important for us to understand this because a passage like the one we're looking at really has to be set in the context of not just 1 John, which is what I've tried to do this morning, but it's also needing to be set in the context of really the whole Bible and how God deals with people when they sin. The truth is that God does not just immediately punish us when we sin. God is very patient. He's very long-suffering. In fact, he deals with us in common grace. God gives good things even to those that are not walking with him, even those who've rejected him. God is very patient with people, but we need to understand that God's ways progressively become more pressured on people as time goes on. The more truth that they've received and rejected, or I should not say received, but they've come in contact with, that they've rejected, the higher the stakes of how God will deal with a person in those situations. And the reason that God does that is ultimately because he wants to bring them to repentance and faith. He wants them to be his child. He wants them to live in a way that's consistent with his will and his ways and consistent with the purpose for which he created them. And so we really need to get into this topic of how does God, a holy, righteous God, relate to people who are sinful, who are rebellious? How does God do that? We're going to break that down uh, next time we're here, and we're going to kind of see how that really applies to the passage we're talking about as well. I hope that this has been a challenge to you this morning. I know it's a little bit weightier topic than what we've typically talked about, but the truth is it's a major a major uh, issue there in the book of 1 John. And so it's important that we discuss it. I hope that this has been a challenge to you, that you've learned some things through it. And tomorrow we'll continue on in the second part of our discussion in 1 John chapter 5. Let's bow together for a word of prayer, and Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Father, thank you for the opportunity to discuss a, a topic that's really important. Whenever we talk about a holy, righteous God and sinful people, it's so important that we understand how you deal with us in our sin. Father, help us to realize that when we sin willfully, when we sin persistently, when we resist your ways, we open the door to a very dangerous set of circumstances for ourselves. We have no right to push in ignorant arrogance against your ways. I pray that you'd help us not to presume against your mercies. Help us to be humbled when you deal with us more firmly over time. And I pray that you'll help us to walk in your ways. Bless each person that's had an opportunity to come in contact with this passage this morning. I pray that you'll encourage them and uh, help us all to think deeply and clearly about what's before us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, it's been good to see each of you this morning. And I know it's kind of a nasty day today. We have a tropical storm moving through our area. But I believe by Wednesday, the weather's supposed to get a little bit better. And uh, hopefully we can see some of you on Wednesday at church. And then again this weekend. Have a blessed rest of your day. Bye now.